Good evening. I'm Ed Rayburn. I'm an extension specialist at WVU. We'll be talking tonight about animal selection and feeding management for pasture finished beef. <clears throat> I'd like us to begin with the end in mind. What are your goals? Product satisfaction for both the consumer and for you as a producer. Reasonable price for both the no, you as a producer and the consumer, and you do want return customers. <clears throat> Let's begin with the end in mind from the standpoint of the product we're dealing with. Uh, here's a good meal, the start of a good meal from a consumer's perspective. <clears throat> uh, as a producer, to make that end product, you know, we have to have uh, animals that are uh, good to make that product. <clears throat> and here's uh, the cow's meal, uh, the meal from the cow's perspective. Uh, what is the quality of that food that's going into the cow uh, to give us the product to give to the consumer? <clears throat> you need to know the, the components of your system and know how to manage them. The market, animal, climate and weather, pasture, forage supply and demand, and do you need a supplement? Some of these things we manage, some of these things we have to manage around. The market, what do your customers want? Uh, low fat, high fat product, uh, cuts or quarters. You want repeat customers. Uh, so that you can sell product. You want happy customers because they're going to also give word of mouth advertising and bring in new customers. <clears throat> Are you involved in a value added certification you know, program like USDA grass fed or organic or some animal welfare program or sustainability program? These programs will determine management options so some of the options that I talk about tonight may not be options in your program if you've chosen to uh, pick a program that says you have to do this or that. <clears throat> the animal. Do you have a breed preference? What frame size animals do you currently have? Are your cattle well muscled? <clears throat> You do need to manage for good body condition or finish. Finish means fatness. Some people talk about pasture finished animals that are not fat. Uh, they're skinny. Uh, skinny animals don't eat well, very well. Uh, no. <clears throat> Maturity or age at harvest, uh, small framed animals mature earlier than large framed animals. Gender. Uh, heifers finish at a lighter weight than steers. Another way of looking at it, at the same body weight, a heifer is going to have more finish than the steer has. I'll be presenting data from a WVU, Virginia Tech, University of Georgia, and USDA ARS pasture-based beef project. <clears throat> uh, this multi-institutional project, uh, no did a lot for us and uh, hopefully it's going to provide in good information for you all. Uh, options I, opinions I express are my own and are based on my 40 years of experience finishing beef cattle on pasture on my own farm. Sometimes with supplements, most of the time without supplements. Okay, in our research we surveyed 149 pasture finished producers across the United States and in Canada. These producers used a variety of breeds. Most used spring calving. Almost all used rotational grazing and legumes as the nitrogen source in their pastures and hay fields. <clears throat> so what type of cattle do we want? Let's start with body conformation. Deep body with good gut capacity, well muscle, moderate frame, with adequate length. <clears throat> Here's a deep bodied cow. <clears throat> a 
About two thirds of her height is body depth. And about one third of her height you know, is what I call sunlight under her belly. So this is the depth we're looking for. We want fairly good length of body. Here's a, no, a WVU performance tested bull from our Wardensville sale. Uh, this type of bull will make calves and cows of high quality you know, with good genetics, uh, good performance, and you no know, documented EPDs for marbling. Uh, that's intermuscular fat and muscle you know, as we measure through ribeye area. Also have good confirmation and eye appeal. Here's a steer from that mating. And a heifer from that type of mating. So what is frame score? Uh, frame score is the animal's hip height at a point in time of their life. Uh, here's an example of two, a frame score four heifer is 45 inches. Uh, tall at 12 months of age. A frame score five heifer is 51 inches tall at 24 months of age. Muscle. Uh, in, if you have a cow herd, uh, or even if you're buying animals, uh, it's good to see uh, if you have EPDs on the sire. Now, if you have a cow herd, you can, you can control that. If you are buying steers, then you have to work with the people you're buying steers from uh, and see if they have EPDs on the sires of these animals. EPDs are very useful, uh, and I highly recommend them. Uh, in a, you know, without EPDs, then you have to just rely on your eyeball, uh, which is not as good at all. But you can look here and you can see we have good you know, ribeye over the tops of these animals and good muscling on the hind quarter. Uh, these animals came from uh, bulls with good EPDs for muscling. Now let's look at some product. Here's a Nice heifer. She's a 30 month old heifer. Here's the steak from that heifer. Uh, you can see how it's a nice uh, round ribeye. Uh, here's, here are some Jersey steer calves uh, that I raised as uh, no pasture finished beef. Uh, here are the steaks from these steers when they reach 30 months of age, the same age as the heifer that we just looked at. Notice the different shape of the ribeye area. These are not a round ribeye. We still have you no know, good marbling, uh, no good flavor. Jerseys are great for flavor, but they are not great for cutout. It, uh, three quarters of an Angus heifer equals one Jersey steer. No. Literally, the flip side of that is one Angus heifer uh, no, equals 1.3, no, one and a third Jersey steers. So, uh, no, breed and cutout value has an important impact on profitability. So, <clears throat> when possible, use ED, EPDs first and then use vis visual appraisal. Uh, we have sour EPDs for marbling. Uh, we'd like to have marbling EPDs being plus for the breed. Muscle uh, measured as ribeye area, uh, average to, to plus for the breed. Yearling weight, uh, negative to average. Why negative? Uh, in a pasture fed system, we want smaller frame animals. Yearling weight is highly related to frame size. So in general, and I say that in general, uh, the bulls that we would be selecting for are going to be average or below average in yearling weight EPD. <clears throat> uh, outliers will occur. 
but those are general rules of thumb. Uh, visual confirmation. Will this animal work well on pasture? Does it have the deep body? Does it have the gut capacity? Uh, we've already talked about muscle, but uh, we want to see that muscle uh, in the animals too, not just on the paper. Uh, the other thing we want to look at is legs and hooves. Uh, do these animals appear to have uh, a good physical structure for working out on the pasture, for moving around out on, that, on the pasture and uh, you know, meeting the goals we need out there? The eye of the master is what finishes the cattle. So we can uh, use the genetic information Phenotype, though, that's part of the eye of the master, you know, looking at those animals, uh, making sure they have the right con confirmation. But then once we get them out on the farm, uh, we have to keep an eye on things, both from the animal perspective and the plant perspective, to allow the animals and the plants to achieve their potential. <clears throat> Body condition score. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a handout on this uh, to get into more details, but basically uh, beef cattle body condition score ranges from one to nine, and it tells us how fat that animal is. Uh, and on average, uh, if we're body condition scoring accurately, a body condition score eight animal will have about 30% fat. Uh, that's based on the research numbers. Now let's take it, this back over to, uh, is that animal finished? <clears throat> uh, if we want an animal in the select to choice range at around the 1,200 pound uh, no, uh, finish weight, it's going to be somewhere above seven and uh, close to eight body condition score is what we need to get that um, you no know, choice, low choice uh, uh, type animal. If you want select, uh, it's still above, a little bit above, you no, know, a body condition score seven. <clears throat> now, in a young animal, body condition score is highly related to uh, previous average daily gain. You can see here, it doesn't matter if you have a, uh, this would be about a frame score five animal. This might be a frame score four, uh, low end of five. Uh, but notice to get that body condition score eight, we need to be gaining close to two pounds a day if we want to get them to that body condition score eight at an early age and at that weight. Now this can be done on pasture. Uh, if we look at the NRC uh, recommends to get that two pounds average daily gain, now they recommend 60% TDM, uh, about 2.8% dry matter intake on a body weight basis. And uh, no, uh, no, as it gets, as this animal gets a little bit larger uh, at that same TDM, the dry matter intake goes down a little bit. Now on pasture, uh, average pasture that we work with is around 68% TDM. We would expect, expect about 3% body weight dry matter intake. Now <clears throat> the recommend for protein is only 9%, but out there in the pasture, uh, we're gonna be running 21% food protein in a cool season grass clover pasture. And actually, that is a problem. <clears throat> uh, it's called urea energy cost. Uh, in high quality pastures that have high crude, pro crude protein content, it's more protein than the cow needs. She has, no, and bear with me, I'm using cow generically uh, for steers, heifers, and cows. Uh, but <clears throat> Uh, they have to break that protein, that excess protein down and excrete it from the body. Uh, in a good pasture, it, they're losing about a quarter of a pound average daily gain because of this. 
compared to what they could theoretically get from the energy in that pasture. This is comparable to about a half a percent of body weight in ground shell corn. <clears throat> That'd be 4.4 pounds of dry shell corn to an 800 pound steer. Now, if, you're, if your system is using a little grain on grass, you can actually use that uh, as a recommend for uh, helping overcome that urea energy cost. Uh, for those of us uh, or you know, that are growing it strictly on forage, we have to live with that energy cost and uh, accept it to some degree. Now we can uh, manage around it as best we can. Uh, one is high quality grass and forbs. Uh, forbs are what some people call broadleaf weeds, uh, dandelion, plantain, chicory. You can actually buy seed for chicory and plantain. Uh, but forbs are as high in TDN as uh, grasses and legumes, but they're low on crude protein as are grasses compared to legumes. So uh, you know, forbs are one way to uh, you know, help. Uh, out there. Forbes also give you good trace minerals that are not found in the grasses and clovers. Uh, season of the year, in the spring and the fall, we have more carbohydrates and more digestible fiber in our cool season pasture, so uh, the bacteria in the rumen are going to do a better job of using that protein. Uh, in the summer, uh, a tool you can use is uh, brown midrib, sudan grass, or millets. Uh, these are going to be high in digestible fiber, uh, high in uh, non-fiber, uh, you know, carbohydrates, uh, and they tend to be lower in crude protein than our cool season grasses. So uh, for those of us that are choosing not to use any grain out there at all, these are some uh, tools that we have to use to uh, minimize the excess urea energy cost. <clears throat> Now, let's look at uh, the impact of winter feeding on what happens in the summer. This was a, a part of our research project run by Jim Neal from ARS, <clears throat> using cattle from Virginia and West Virginia. Uh, Jim set up three rations, uh, not much difference in crude protein uh, or NDF, a little bit of difference. The main difference here is in TDN. Uh, so we have a, you know, a low TDN ration and a high TDN ration. Uh, the low TDN ration gave us uh, 0.6 pounds average daily gain. <clears throat> uh, the high TDN ration gave us uh, 1.7 pounds uh, average daily gain during the winter. So we were able to get a difference there in average daily gain over the winter. Now, what did that do during the summer? Here's our winter gain uh, across this line, 0.64, 1.74. Now, here's the summer gain uh, out on pasture, 2.13 and 1.65. So you can see that the animals that gained less during the winter gained more during the summer. But let's look at that in terms of weight per day of age. Uh, the ones that gained lower during the winter, they did gain more in the summer, but they're still, uh, in terms of total weight per day of age, they didn't quite catch up with their herd mate over here. Uh, <clears throat> now, one of the problems with these cattle, they were all harvested in September at 18 months of age, uh, but they weren't finished, okay? Let's be honest. Uh, uh, carcass weight was too small. Uh, it's well under 600 pounds. <clears throat> Quality grade was uh, below low select. Uh, we didn't even make high select on this. None of them made choice. <clears throat> uh, so why did that happen? We knew what was happening. <laughs> uh, this was an experiment. 
Uh, the experimental control were feedlot steers that were defined to be harvested at 18 months. And the research protocol called for all animals to be harvested at the same age. Now, that's what we have to do in research sometimes. Farmers don't have to do that. Again, we come back to the eye of the master to know when to harvest the animals uh, and not to harvest just at a given age. <clears throat> so we can learn from this. <clears throat> uh, as I said, no, uh, we had cattle in a feedlot that were the control animals, and these were siblings, uh, you know, brothers to the uh, animals out on pasture, so they're all the same genetics. <clears throat> and so here we have uh, our three treatments and the, uh, the final weight uh, when they were harvested. So here's the final bo body weight and the quality grade of those carcasses. And here are the feedlot animals on the corn silage diet, final weight and uh, USDA quality grade. The important thing here is notice this number. This is the slope of that line. 0 0.11, 0 0.011. Notice that the slope up here is identical. So body weight at harvest has a linear effect. And it didn't matter if they were on pasture or up here in the feedlot, but it, they both had a linear effect on quality grade. Now this number here is a little different. And uh, I'll show you how that works out. Don't worry about it. Just let's look at the numbers. This is what it tells us. Steers out on pasture needed to be left out on pasture for another 80 to 90 days. In that 80 to 90 days, to get to a quality grade of four, they would have been about 1,200 pounds, a little over, just a hair over. Uh, 30 to 40 pounds heavier than the ones in the feedlot. <clears throat> now that's not all bad. If we left them out there, you know, September, October, into November, excuse me, at our lo location, that's some of the best finishing pasture that we have during the year. Now we have to make sure we manage the, f the farm so that we have forage to feed them at that time of year. But in terms of quality, that's not an issue. Uh, <clears throat> now, Let's look at it a little different way. Uh, different ages at harvest allow different weight per day of age. Uh, now this could be if you have a cow-calf operation as part of your finishing program, or you could look at this as uh, animals that you're buying from the neighbor. Uh, no, and I'm using a 78 pound uh, calf weight for starter, which is you know, a ballpark for uh, an Angus animal. Uh, but uh, if, if I'm trying to finish at 18 months of age, I've got to have 2.1 pounds you know, of weight per day of age. If I'm willing to harvest at 24 months of age, then to get that same rate uh, weight, uh, it's 1.5 pounds per day of age. And if you go to 30 months uh, for the same weight, it's 1.2 pounds per day of age. Uh, so those are the, that's the balance that you can do on the farm. How, what is the age that I would prefer to have them harvested at? And to reach that goal, what weight per day of age do I need to be achieving? An important point is this right here, with no period of stress or loss of weight. Uh, if we have loss of weight, the first fat that is used uh, by that animal in the loss of weight uh, is uh, intermuscular fat, <clears throat> the marbling that we don't want to lose. So uh, that's why we you know it's, it's not bad to have low rate of gain as long as we don't go into a stress period where we actually start losing weight in the animal. Okay. We manage body condition score uh, through adequate forage mass and forage allowance. Uh, forage quality, value, uh, remember this acronym here, 
vegetative, available, adequate legume content, uh, throw in the forbs in that area too, uh, utilize the forge uh, to the proper residual height, and do this in tune with the environment. Uh, the environment's going to affect the forage and the animal. <clears throat> okay, forage supply. A forage supply is plant growth rate. Uh, we can look at it uh, you know, on a seasonal basis, uh, uh, within the season, and not on the annual basis. Demand you know, is the animal requirement. Uh, number and size of animals by animal class, if you have more than just one class of animal in your system. Uh, cow, no, uh, uh, heifer, steer, if all you have are finishing animals, then you just have one class. Uh, what's their dry matter intake and TDN requirement? And it's your grazing management that, you know, where you're going to try to you know, do your best to have uh, supply equal demand you know, during that grazing period. <clears throat> Here are some typical gra uh, supply and demand curves. Uh, this uh, line here, a blue line, uh, cool season grass, forage growth rate. Uh, you know, high growth rate in the spring slows down. We might have a summer slump. Uh, warm season uh, grass, forage growth rate. This would be our brown midrib Sudan grass or millet. Uh, you know, uh, here's our uh, demand curve for a cow calf herd. <clears throat> uh, you know, calf growing, and then we're going to you know, wean that calf off the cow and either ship the calf off the farm uh, or move it into the fattening herd over here. Uh, here's the demand on just the fattening herd as we go through the year. Now in this part of the year you can see that, you know, uh, especially winter, that's an <laughs> easy example, uh, we don't have forage growth, we need to have a buffer. Uh, the buffer is just uh, how do we balance supply and demand. Now let's just look real quick here at different environments because different environments are going to give you different dis distribution curves. And just here in West Virginia, here is Terra Alta up around 3,000 feet elevation. We don't have a summer slump there. Uh, doesn't occur. <clears throat> if you go over an hour's drive roughly, uh, maybe an hour and a half, uh, closer to an hour, more feel. Uh, you can see now we have a distinct summer slump. <clears throat> uh, why, why am I showing three curves? This middle curve is the average, uh, median specifically. So half the time it's going to be above that midline, half the time it's going to be below. This lower line is what we call one standard deviation below. Don't get hung up on fancy words like standard deviation. Just remember a deviation is that, a deviation. Standard means it's just standard. And the way to interpret here is one in three years, your growth rate's gonna be within this range. One in three years, it's gonna be there. Now, one in six years, it's gonna be up here. One in six years, it's gonna be down here. And I'm just trying to show you your odds. Now, you're on this, pre, no, on this meeting, and I'm assuming you're a farmer. Since you're a farmer, I know you're a gambler. And so as a gambler, you, know, you need to know your odds. And that's all this standard deviation is telling you, is the odds. Uh, one in three up here, between the median and that one standard deviation above, and that's your odds down here. Uh, so. Uh, you need to know when to hold them and when to fold them since you are a gambler, right? So buffers. Buffers, uh, you need them. You got to have them. Uh, timing of your livestock production with a forage cycle, making hay and grazing the aftermath, that's an option. Strategic nitrogen fertilization. Uh, vary your stocking rate. Uh, one option you do have, uh, if you want to, uh, buy more animals than you can finish. Uh, grow part of them out, and the ones that you don't like as well, sell them in July uh, so that you have more grass for the animals that you want to finish. 
actually here in West Virginia, uh, our highest price for yearling cattle uh, is 1st of August at our board sale. Uh, you, you'll have to check your own local market. Uh, how can you, if you choose to do that, I'm just saying it's an option uh, that works very well for us here in West Virginia, uh, if chosen to do it that way. Uh, use legumes, uh, deep brooded forbs like your chicory. Uh, use warm season, cool season forages at different times of the year. Uh, if things get bad, feed supplemental forage. It could be high quality hay. <clears throat> Uh, or again, if you have different classes of animals, you could take animals uh, that are you know, not fattening, put them on a lower quality supplemental forage to get them through uh, and save your best forage for the, the fattening animal. Uh, otherwise, you waste forage or overgraze. Uh, for a fattening animal, uh, we can waste forage. You don't want to overgraze. That won't work very well. Except change in animal rate of gain or body condition uh, I don't think that's a good option. Uh, it's used in third world countries, but we're, we're, we can be better than that. We can measure and know what we're doing. Uh, here's an example. Uh, strip grazing aftermath hay meadow uh, in the fall can be done in the summer. Uh, I recommend only taking first cut hay and you know, saving all of your aftermath for grazing. Uh, again my opinion for what it's worth. <clears throat> Another option is uh, stockpiling tall fescue. Uh, now, obviously, uh, you're having to give up some uh, feed that you're gr gonna, could have grazed in the summer, but I've had years when it was dry and I actually fed hay in August uh, during a dry period and it gave me enough grass uh, in the fall that I was able to graze into January. Uh, so uh, think about that. There may be times when you actually want to feed hay uh, during what we'll call the summer, uh, but you're doing it as a management protocol so that when the moisture comes back, you're going to get more growth you know, elsewhere on the farm. <clears throat> No, measure and budget supply and demand. Again, there's a handout on this. <laughs> inventory your livestock numbers and size, inventory your pasture forage <clears throat> and growth rate. Uh, no, inventory your stored hay, and stockpile reserves. Uh, we take that as a granted, but I've seen times when uh, farmers forgot to do that and really ran into trouble because they hadn't bothered to how, how many hay bales they had and how many hay bales did they need. Uh, develop your appropriate budgets. Uh, inventory forage quality, TDM, NDF crude protein. Uh, and when you do a forage sample, you know, sample what you expect the animals to eat. That's the key right there. <clears throat> okay, we can measure height, be it with a ruler or forage mass. Uh, again, handouts on that, I'm not going to dwell on it, a uh, calibration table in the handouts. Here's the principle. Now this is real world, this is not theory, <clears throat> uh, but you do have to be able to manage and measure. Uh, no, classic orchard grass uh, clover pasture that's 10 inches high by ruler is going to be around 2,500 pounds of dry matter. That same pasture when grazed down to a four inch height is going to be somewhere around uh, you no know, uh, thousand uh, to 1200 pounds. <clears throat> uh, again, rough rules of thumb. Uh, when I'm up in this high level of forage mass, there's plenty of forage and forage mass is not what is limiting dry matter intake from the cow. When we drop over to the left of this shoulder. <clears throat> now we have so little forage out there that the cow can't get a full mouthful. And she can adjust by taking more mouthfuls a day, but uh, actually at this point, uh, she can't take enough more mouthfuls per day to keep forage intake up. So forage intake starts going down. So uh, keep this in mind, forage mass and dry matter intake. 
The green line, this is selective grazing. Selective grazing is the ability of an animal in a pasture to eat forage that is higher quality than the average pasture quality in the pasture. And from our research, <clears throat> we found that the first few bites when we turned the cattle out there, crude protein is about 30% higher uh, than average in those first few bites. TDM, about 10% higher than average. NDF, uh, lower than average. Uh, Non-structural carbohydrates, these are the uh, sugars and starches in our forages, about 20% higher than average. <clears throat> so that's when they start, but as you, you know, have the cattle graze the pasture off, uh, when you get down in this range, it starts going to zero because you know, they've eaten off the best and left the rest. And uh, at this point, it's come to uh, the average. But this is the tool you have to work with. So here, you know, we have some cattle uh, on fresh pasture. Uh, rotational grazing is nice because it allows to manage animals and the pasture at the same time. We can keep pasture quality high. Uh, we can for manage forage mass and forage utilization easily uh, to make sure we're keeping animal performance high. And just to remind you, finishing cattle need to be working up in this part of the forage mass range. If I have dry cows, I can work with them over here, especially if I need to clean up pasture or to stimulate clovers uh, you know, for use by the finishing animals later on. <clears throat> So what residual sward height you know, uh, do I want uh, to maintain near maximum production? If you have a cow-calf herd, uh, it's three to four inches of height. Depends on the level of production of uh, milk. Uh, that's why I like cows with low milk production. Uh, wean calves, uh, four and a half to five inches. Uh, finishing beef cattle, uh, three and a half to four inches. Now. Uh, these are numbers, uh, I, I, I stand behind them, but I didn't make them up myself. <laughs> uh, research out of New Zealand, Australia, Britain, all confirm these numbers. Uh, I guess if anything, even though the New Zealanders say three and a half, I'd prefer it to be four for a finishing animal. Uh, I'd prefer it to be four or a little bit higher where I'm trying to really finish that animal and get good uh, fat. Uh, no being laid down. So no, no uh, shorter than four inches for that finishing animal. Now, uh, in all cases, ensure adequate rest interval so that that grass gets back to an eight to 12 inch height before it's grazed again. So uh, yeah, we might, uh, let's take this number here, the dry cow, I might take it down to two inches uh, because I want to clean it up, get, uh, get it cleaned up good, get the clover coming back good, but now I'm going to let it grow back to at least 10 inches before it's grazed again by my finishing animal uh, or my wean calves. So uh, you know, we have to allow you know, adequate rest, especially when we graze it tight. Another way to look at it is daily forage allowance. If you give two times the potential dry matter intake, you'll have maximum intake. So uh, if we have a finishing animal, I'd like 3% of dry matter, you know, uh, potential dry matter intake of 3% of body weight, <clears throat> which means for every thousand pounds of body weight, I need 30 pounds of forage mass, dry matter out there. I'm gonna multiply that by two. So uh, to have two times potential, I really need to have 60 pounds of dry matter for every thousand pounds of body weight that's going to be in that pasture. <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, if it's the dry cow cleaning an area up, 2% uh, uh, dry matter intake times two, 40 pounds of dry matter per thousand pounds of body weight out in that field. Now what, what can the cows teach us? <clears throat> Uh, I like scatter diagrams. Some people do, some people don't. <laughs> Each dot represents a pasture, okay? 
And here's the running average, uh, the regression line across all those pastures. And what it's telling us is that along this regression line, for every pound of initial forage mass, uh, dry matter, uh, they're eating no 56% of that, 0.56, uh, you know, 56% of that initial forage mass above a certain height. So we draw this line back here to uh, zero on the x-axis, and we find that that height is 700 pounds, which is roughly two inches, depending on your for, uh, field, but roughly two inches. Uh, now, this number, uh, 0.56, that's pretty close to 50%. A lot of you will remember the old saying, uh, let the cows eat half and leave half, or graze half and leave half. And that uh, number is close enough to say that the cows are agreeing with that rule of thumb. But why the two inches? Well, did you believe that uh, grass talks back to the cows? Uh, this ruler uh, should be a little bit higher up because uh, right about here is ground level. And I'd like to have that ruler right about here, but uh, here's the leaf on the orchard grass plant. And this uh, pseudo stem, this lower stem, is about two inches long. Uh, it's too tough for the cows to get into. They don't want to get into that. Uh, and we don't want them to get into that. Uh, that's where the carbohydrate reserves are. That's actually also where new leaf growth already is. If I were to graze this off in uh, 24 hours, uh, down to that two inch level, and then get the cows off, it'd be like a, uh, a hay mower. And a lot of you have seen that on orchard grass, especially if I, if I cut orchard grass at a two inch stubble height in cool weather, and I come back uh, 24, 48 hours later, I'm gonna have that uh, leaf that's down in this sheaf uh, sticking up there uh, two to three inches high. So uh, this two inches does have meaning within context of the pasture that we're working with. And this is the type of pasture I'd like to have, nice amount of orchard grass. That could be endophyte free fescue or endophyte enhanced tall fescue. I've got my clovers, I've got my forbs. Uh, I want a mixture out there. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to manage the system uh, for the animal requirement, forage supply, and uh, we want to see if we need supplements or not. <clears throat> I do encourage forage sampling and testing. Again, we have handouts on that. Uh, we when I work with farmers intensely, uh, I try to get them to sample pastures once a month, uh, whatever pasture the cattle are going into, uh, say the first week of the month, we're gonna sample that pasture. Uh, it'll be a different pasture in a different month, uh, but it's gonna give me good numbers, so I start getting a handle on what uh, my pastures are doing. Um, uh, you follow the cattle around and have the cow teach you how to sample the pasture. Uh, don't do it at random. You follow the cow and learn from the cow. Uh, and I, farmers can do that, uh, it works well. Uh, hay and baleage, uh, sample each lot each year. Uh, if you grow it your own or even if you buy it, try to get a uniform lot of hay and so you can sample it and get the forage analysis. Forage sampling gives a good return. Uh, when we've documented it, we, we get a $10 return for every dollar invested in forage testing when we use the numbers. Bottom line, book values don't work very well. I should say textbook values. Uh, just to show you the range, uh, averages over about a thousand hay samples and a thousand pasture samples, just to show you that on average, uh, uh, hay has 11% protein, 54% DDN, 67% NDF, uh, pastures 21 protein, 68 TDN, 50% NDF. Sorry, but not all of our children are above average. Uh, half of them are. Half of them are below average, and that's why we want a forage test, so that we know where are we in terms of uh, 
the quality of the forage we're dealing with. Uh, time of year is going to have an impact. A lot of you know this. In the spring and in the fall, we're going to have higher energy forage than during the summer, especially uh, June. For us, that's when seed heads are coming out. We're not perfect in controlling seed heads like you know, many of you are, so we have to work, work around that. Uh, but uh, that's why we work you know, in tune with the environment. <clears throat> Ration NDF. Increases NDF intake, but decreases dry matter. Now, something I want to emphasize here, <clears throat> you're going to hear a lot of talk about uh, a cow uh, can only eat 2.5% uh, NDF. That's right there. 2.5% of their body weight is NDF. Somebody forgot to tell the cows this, uh, because you know, as ration NDF went up, uh, you no know, NDF intake went up. But over here, you'll see dry matter intake went down. <clears throat> uh, now these are dairy cows being fed high energy rations. These are the beef cows. Now for beef cattle, we're gonna generally be working at the 40% NDF range and higher. Actually, if you drop below 40% NDF, we now run into a situation where we don't have enough fiber. And in those situations in the spring and the fall, uh, finishing cattle and weaning cattle, especially, and, and uh, mama cows too, they want some long dry hay. Uh, and at these lower uh, pasture NDFs, passage rate is so high that the cow's rumen can't digest the forage adequately. And so by making available some long dry hay, it slow down, slows down rate of passage and increases digestibility of that pasture. <clears throat> so uh, just keep in mind, uh, we want to be working in this uh, 40 uh, to 60% NDF range. Now, you know, we have examples here with uh, beef cattle all the way up to 70% NDF. Uh, and uh, that's doable, especially if you have native warm season grasses. Something else that you need to be thinking about when you uh, are winter feeding, especially, is what is the crude protein to TDN ratio? Uh, as you remember, uh, we're actually feeding bacteria in the rumen, and the rumen bacteria feed the cows. Rumen bacteria need a crude protein to TDN ratio of gr greater than 0.2. When it falls, Below that, they don't have enough protein, and they're, uh, they're starved. And because they're starved, they don't digest the forage quick enough. Because they don't digest the forage quick enough, the cow doesn't eat the forage as, uh, as much as they could. So when we're over here, uh, we're starving bacteria. Uh, when we're over here, uh, we have excess protein, and we are going to have excess urea energy loss. So this curve is useful information. <clears throat> now, uh, over here, uh, we, we need to supplement the protein. Now, if you're all forage, that's where if you have some high protein, second cut uh, legume hay, that can be your protein supplement. It could be grass hay too, if it was well fertilized grass hay. Uh, and I've done that, uh, get some, uh, you know, good grass clover hay that's 16% uh, protein and feed a little bit of that uh, along with that low protein hay and that was my protein supplement. The other option would be soybean meal if you're uh, feeding, if your marketing program allows soybean meal, that's an option or distiller's grain. Uh, pastures are going to frequently be up here. Some of your best quality hay will be up here. Uh, if you're not on an all forage program, uh, this is where feeding a little bit of corn or barley uh, can use up that excess protein. You know, again, we're feeding the bacteria uh, to get them to use the protein. They're going to feed the cow and we're going to get better average daily gain on the cattle. Uh, but again, it depends on the marketing program you're in, your philosophy. Uh, uh, how do you want to use the knowledge that we have? 
Uh, and your marketing program is going to have a big impact on that. Uh, let's look at some supplemental feeds. Uh, these are commodity feeds. Uh, again, supplements can be hay, uh, uh, so that's why I push forage testing. But uh, in general, we want to look at uh, supplements. Are they a crude protein supplement or an energy supplement, a high TDN supplement? So uh, just going down the list, this is an alphabetical list. So barley's at the top. <laughs> Uh, crude protein of 12 percent, uh, not pretty low. Uh, corn gluten feed, a uh, 24 percent. That's a protein feed. Uh, whole cotton seeds, a uh, protein feed. Distiller's grain, uh, high protein. Uh, soybean meal. That's kind of the classic uh, of all uh, protein supplements. Uh, TDN, uh, barley, real high in uh, TDN. That's the measure of uh, energy. Uh, so hominy feed, low in protein, high in energy. Um, where's the other one? Soy hulls. Uh, this one is uh, acceptable to most all forage programs. Uh, protein, not real great. Uh, TDN, not real great. Uh, uh, but uh, it's right on the, the average sample for soy hulls is right on the borderline uh, for what the bacteria need. Uh, so if the best way to evaluate a crude protein supplement is the T, crude protein to TDN, when we're over uh, well, in this neighborhood of 0.3, those are really good uh, protein supplements uh, if those are useful or usable on your farm. Uh, now, carbohydrate feed. Uh, the natural feeds like barley, oats, shell corn, those are high in carbohydrate because that's the way mother nature makes them. When we run them through a, a, a industrial process, uh, uh, we take the carbohydrates out. So corn gluten feed has had the starch taken out of corn. Uh, distiller's grain, we uh, took all the starch out of uh, the you know, corn to make uh, whiskey, uh, no, the, the alcohol. <laughs> Uh, so uh, these feeds that have been uh, processed, uh, all we're getting is the non-carbohydrate fraction. Uh, so we don't have to, and, and the reason for that is if I'm feeding a low uh, quality hay, I don't want to feed uh, starch because it interferes with the digestion of a low quality hay. Now, yes, uh, for us on pasture, we want to have as much forage in the diet as possible. The research uh, done at Virginia Tech as part of our multi-institutional uh, project showed that 30 to 60 days on straight pasture feed was enough to get the omega-3 fatty acids up to the levels that we want them in that meat product. So uh, yes, you can use some of these. Uh, in your winter program if you want to, and your marketing program uh, uh, does not disapprove of their use, uh, but then get your cattle out on uh, straight pasture during the summer uh, for you know, th at least 30 days, per, and I would say preferably 60 days, just to give a, a little uh, buffer there uh, uh, to ensure that you get all those omega-3 fatty acids out there. So just coming back to, body weight and average daily gain, uh, <clears throat> how much dry matter intake do I have to have? Uh, just to maintain weight on a steer, uh, so this is a growing steer, uh, three different age uh, weight classes, average pasture, just to maintain body weight, I need a 2% dry matter intake. 2% of their body weight dry matter intake, just to maintain weight. <clears throat> if I want that two pound a day gain, I've got to go at least up to 3% or over. But what, remember what we said, if this is high quality, cool season pasture at 20% crude protein, I'm shooting for two pounds a day, but I'm really only going to get a pound and three quarters because of that excess protein. Now, if that's brown midrib, sedan grass, or millet, now I may be getting, and we've seen 
those uh, crops, yes, get that two pounds a day gain. So keep in mind, uh, there's uh, what we expect to get based on energy, but there is always that potential loss uh, uh, if you have excess protein. And remember your tool. How much forage do you have out there? Uh, you can measure it with a ruler or a pasture plate. Uh, what is the selective grazing that you're allowing out there? What is the time of year that you're dealing with? Just to show off some calves out on good pasture, you can see that uh, these are wean calves being backgrounded. They've got plenty of feed and uh, it meets that statement of value. Vegetative, available, a loom, legume, <laughs> utilized to the pro proper level and in tune with the environment. <clears throat> Talk real quick about drought management. Uh, remember half of the time you're in drought, half the time you know, forage growth rate is less than average. Uh, you need to have a plan. Uh, you need to be measuring. The plan allows you to prepare for drought so you reduce any negative effects and the need for recovery. Uh, your plan needs to include what you're going to do during the drought, uh, uh, implementing the plan so you minimize any damage to the grass or the cattle, and then afterwards recovering from drought. Uh, you know, if it really got bad, you, know, uh, you may have to do things. Here's the real uh, rule of thumb. Stock the farm at 85% of the economic carrying capacity to manage for drought 85% of the time. That's an old Texas proverb I heard well over 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And I've, okay, experience and also research uh, here in West Virginia, but experience both in West Virginia and Virginia has proven this right on the mark for this region. And I mean right on the mark, within one percentage point right on the mark. <laughs> So keep that in mind, low stocking rate. Uh, high stocking rates, the way, uh, you're asking for trouble. Uh, the rule of thumb, 85% of the economic stocking rate, uh, it only costs you 3% uh, of your net margin. Uh, lower stocking rate, bigger calves, drought management, and make sure you have plenty of feed for finishing those beef cattle. The tools, animal management, no, the big tool is the eye of the master. No, you're measuring, watching, doing those things. Fat cow is half wintered. That to me is an important tool for the animal side. I want to look at EPDs, frame score, body conformation, body condition, keep an eye on that over the year, herd health, vaccinations, uh, animal selection, forage management. You can't starve a profit out of the cow. And that's another rule of thumb that uh, the three big ones, uh, that 85%, and then these two uh, rules there. If you live by them, they're going to take you 90% of the way there. Uh, rotational grazing, timing and intensity, how much forage mass, what was the residual forage height, pasture budgeting, soil testing. We didn't, uh, this talk doesn't get into that, but you want to soil test, uh, use the proper lime fertilizer. Forage test, we talk about that. Uh, appreciate your clovers, your forbs, and quality grasses. Those are all the tools that you have. Uh, well, you have more tools, but those are the important tools you have. <laughs> so at this time, uh, we'll stop, and uh, hopefully we have some time for some questions. Thanks for being with us. Have a good evening.